All right, I'm going to be preaching on salvation today, but I want to just like talk about, you know, some more, some of the more complex issues around it. Um, some of these will be familiar to you guys, but I think it's good to think about these again because these always come up when you're trying to explain salvation to people, and it's good to have get your head around these things and understand it really well. Um, you know, salvation is simple. Isn't it? It's a it's a simple compl- it's a simple concept, you know. But you know what gets complex? What gets complex is when you need to defend something that is simple. Because you know you may, you know, salvation is simple. You know, we're sinners. We need a savior. Believe on Jesus Christ. And we're saved eternally. But then you have implications of that. You have objections to that. You have you know all these. Th- this is what makes it complex and you know the, the more I think about you know when I started getting into like self-defense and jiu-jitsu it's like it's very similar um, you know where things that seem basic are not that basic I mean you, you know even though you know you think you, you watch an MMA fight you know, like the UFC and you think yeah, we well, just got to punch the other person right well that that concept's simple isn't it but then it's it's not so easy to actually get it done. I mean, a lot of us are watching the World Cup now. It's like, okay, you just have to put the ball into the back of the net. But that's, that concept is easy, but to actually do it and do it well is, is not that easy. You know, there's, there's defenders, people trying to stop you. So it's the same in the Christian life. You, know? you can learn the move. You can, you can learn the concept but then defending it and actually putting it into practice where you have to actually persuade somebody that, like, like, like they say in jiu-jitsu, like now try and do it on a resisting opponent. You know, it's like now try and convince somebody that is not just agreeing to everything that you're saying. That's when it gets difficult. Um, and I think about, I listened to a podcast recently, um, like one of these really good jiu-jitsu players. If you, I don't know if you follow, you guys might not follow jiu-jitsu, but there's a Gracie, his name's Hodger Gracie. Right, and he was like, he's the undisputed, like, greatest of all time, gi jiu jitsu guy. And you know, what, what really shocked people about his game because now when you watch jiu jitsu, it's like very complicated and doing all these sorts of rolling, all these sorts of moves, right? But his, his method, it was like he was, he was like submitting like world class black belts with like moves that you would learn in like your first class of jiu jitsu. You know, so you'd learn like a cross collar choke from Mount, and it's like, and he was, but he was doing that on like these world class black belts. So everyone would always say to him that he had a very basic game. You know, they say like, you know, his game was like you know, just the fundamentals. He learned it really, really well, and it's just like he was just choking them out with these basic moves. So, anyways, now that he's not competing, it's interesting with 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 uh, um, athletes. You know, now that they, when they stop competing, that's when they start letting their guard down, they go on podcasts, they start revealing a lot of their secrets and their mindsets. It's very, it's very interesting, I find. And he was saying on this podcast, you know, people keep calling my, they say game, they keep calling my game basic. And he's like, it's not basic at all. And he's like saying, you know, just, just because it's a move that you learn very early on, but you try doing it on a resisting opponent, you try and do it where that person knows that move as well. Can you still do it? And he's saying that's what makes it complex, that even though they know that move is coming, they can't stop it. So I think, you know, we want our Christianity to be like that. It's like they know our position, but then they just can't resist it. They can't dispute the, the logic or the facts and the arguments. You know, that's what you want to get to. Um, so I just saw the see the similarities and that, you know, even in the Bible, the Bible uses a lot of analogy with fighting and wrestling and war, and, you know, I just, uh, the, the, the analogy just fits so perfectly, where we have this spiritual wrestling, and it's very similar with fighting. You need to know how to attack, you need to know how to defend, you need to know all the different ways that people can come at you, and that's what makes you a complete fighter. And in the Christian life, what's going to make you a complete soldier of Jesus Christ is knowing these things. This is why I always say, like, knowing what you believe is not enough. You know, you can, you can have knowledge, but can you defend what you believe? Do you understand it so well that you can defend and, and reasonably talk through these things? So, you know, salvation is simple. 
but defending the simple can be complex. And, you know, I want you to understand this topic extremely well. Of all the topics that you want to understand well, I mean, this is one of them, right? Salvation, eternal security, you know, like how salvation works, how to explain it. And, it, you know, if you understand salvation very well, not just that you are saved, that you understand salvation very well, it gives you that added stability in your Christian life. Right? You will be a lot more stable in your Christian life because you not only know what, but you know why. And then you, you don't get thrown off so much if people dispute what you believe. You know? So like think about that in fighting. You know? You're not going to get knocked out, knocked about so much if you know how to defend yourself. Um, and it gives you more confidence, doesn't it? It gives you more confidence to speak out in your faith. You know, this is why a lot of people don't talk about their faith. You know, you, you know, sometimes we go and we ask people about what they believe and you know, they don't want to talk about it. Not, it's not, not always because you know, they think it's a personal thing and they just like it. but sometimes people don't want to talk about it because they're not really confident with somebody probing into what they believe and people don't really want to be tested about what they believe because they don't want their inconsistencies being revealed so not only will you, we want you to be able to clearly explain it to someone else we want to be able to defend it right, from false teachers as well so some of these things, I won't spend too much time on them because some of them are quite basic, but, uh, but the reason why I'm bringing up the topic is what's important. Now, first point is, remember, there are technically two ways to heaven. Now, the problem is, one of them is impossible. But you don't want to forget that technically there are two ways that the Bible mentions to be saved. Right? One of them is works. Right? So that exists... But what's the problem? It's impossible. So the, 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 when we say that there's one way to be saved, really what we're saying is that there's one way that is possible to be saved. Right? There's another way, but it's impossible. Right? So we see that in the Bible. You know, we, the two ways, you've got grace, you've got works. Grace, what is it? Unmerited favour. Favour you can't, you don't deserve. It's given to you by God. It's the grace of God. Works, it's like a merited reward. That's why it's the wages. You know, wages, you do something, what do you earn? Right? Now, why do I say this? Why is this important for you guys to internalize? That, you know, you say, oh, you know, it's like, why, why do we go so deep on this and that sort of thing? Well, because this is why there are verses like this in the Bible. Right? Luke 10, 25. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? He answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. Now why is, this, so why is it important that you understand that there's these two covenants in the Bible. There are these two ways to be saved. Because you know what? Somebody that believes in work salvation is going to bring up this verse to you. And if you don't understand this point that I say again and again in these sermons, you're going to be like, I don't get it. I thought salvation was by grace. I don't know why these verses in there. You see what I'm saying? So if you don't get what I'm saying about there are these two methods for salvation, then you won't fully internalize why these verses are here. And you'll get thrown off. You don't really understand. Like, and people show you these verses, like, huh? So, you, know, you read to verse 28, it's like, oh, I thought, I, thought it's, I thought it's salvation by grace. Why is Jesus teaching work salvation here? Well, it's because what he's saying is not false, right? It's true, but you've got to ask the question, why is Jesus responding this way? Right? We just take a story and then run with it and contradict clear statements in the Bible, like Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 and whatnot, you know, it's because there's, there's a reason Jesus is doing this. The reason is, is he's revealing to these people that it's not possible to justify yourself through works. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jericho. Oh, wait, did I actually go into a different passage? Oh, this is, uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, what readest thou? He says, that was answer right, let's do it. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So this is the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? So this is when he goes into this one, when somebody asks him how, how he must should inherit eternal life, goes into the parable of the Good Samaritan. 
Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, wounded him, departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So these people are ignoring this person. One person goes on the other side of the road. Likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. So the Levite at least looks on him and then passes on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn, took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbour unto him that fell among thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go, and do thou likewise. So, if you are not solid in understanding salvation, understanding that the Bible has two methods of salvation, and one is impossible, yet there is teaching about that in the Bible, you may go to a passage like this in a, in a, in a debate or while you're preaching the gospel, and they say, like, isn't Jesus there saying you've got to keep works to be saved? So you don't want to be thrown off. So you need to understand. Well, it's because what he's saying is true, it's right, but it's not the full picture. The full picture is it's not possible. This is why these people are trying to justify themselves He's showing them that they are, that he hasn't been like the Good Samaritan. Now, obviously, any teaching about good works, we can learn good things about them. You know, like how this is a commendable way to live. But is it the way of salvation? No. Rich young ruler is the same. A certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good save one that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honour thy father and thy mother. So is Jesus teaching work salvation? In a sense, yes, but why? Show that it's not possible. He said, all these things have I kept from my youth up. And when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, yet lackest thou one thing. And I think this is just Jesus being gracious to him. He doesn't just lack one thing but he is revealing to him one thing that he has not done perfectly. I don't think this is the only thing. Sell all that thou hast and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Come, follow me. So what is he he revealing to him? Don't be materialistic. Live for the things of this world. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very, very rich. When Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. They that heard it said, Who then can be saved? And he said, The things which are impossible with man are possible with God. (coughs) So Jesus here, yes, he is teaching the old covenant. But why? To show them that they haven't kept it. Right? So likewise... In, there are old, the, the, this is in the Old Testament too. So sometimes, you know, I try and explain this to people and I don't always know whether they fully understand what I'm trying to say, which is why I'm like sort of repeating and thinking about it today. Is just think about these terms, right? You have Old Testament and New Testament. Now, what do those words actually mean? The Old Testament, the Old Testament, the covenant, the Old Covenant, that was. What was actually the Old Testament? It was Moses delivering the law. If you obey, you're going to get blessed. If you disobey, you're going to be cursed. This is the Old Testament. Just, just, just don't get confused with the terminology, right? So, so where does the word Old Testament come from? It's the Old Testament. It's this old promise, which is what the Old Testament scriptures, which we refer to, they, they, they have contained in it. But why do we call them the Old Testament Scriptures? It's because they were... It's not that the Old Testament Scriptures only contain teaching about the Old Testament. Right? We call, we call them the Old Testament Scriptures because they were written prior to the New Testament commencing. So they're in, they're in the Old Testament. But they recount things even prior to the Old Testament coming into place, right? Because they recount creation. They recount, you know... Abraham and all this, this was before the Old Testament was put into place. The Old Testament was put into place when? At Moses. This is why we, they refer to it the law of Moses. 
Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which you have not known. Now, somebody might use this passage to teach your work salvation. Now, you want you, what I want you to understand in this first point is, why is this here? Well, it's because this is the Old Covenant. This is the Old Testament. Right? Now, what is the New Testament? The New Testament is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. Grace. You know, righteousness through submitting to the righteousness of Christ. Not righteousness through your own law. But where people get confused is when we... See, people will say Old Testament times, right? Which is, which is right, because the Old Testament scriptures are in Old Testament times, because prior to the New Testament beginning. But remember, when did the New Testament begin? At the death of the testator, right? Jesus dies, he rises again. So, the new, in the New Testament scriptures, why do we call them the New Testament scriptures? It's because they were written after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's when they were written. But they recount events happening still in Old Testament times. Right? So, it's important that you just don't get mixed up with these terminologies. Sometimes when I'm trying to explain to people these things, we mix up that terminology in our head. So we'll say the Old Testament scriptures, but then I say, you know, they're, they're in the Old Testament scriptures, we see the Old Testament, which is salvation by works, right, which is not possible, but we also see the New Testament. The, the, we see shadows of the New Testament, the New Covenant, Covenant of Grace, in the Old Testament scriptures, which is, you know, some of the things we see there. But what I, the point I'm making right now is don't forget that these two covenants exist. So we will see them in the New Testament scriptures, like we saw in the Gospels, but Jesus is talking to people in Old Testament times because he still has not died. Because it's, right? So try and internalize that if you can. Sometimes I, I talk to people, I feel like don't fully grasp that. So you have passages like Deuteronomy. You have passages like Ezekiel. And this is why the work salvationists, they can find verses that teach work salvation. They're there. Right? You want to find a passage that teaches work salvation? They're in the Bible. Why? Because of these two covenants. Ezekiel 18. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, saith the Lord. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dies, saith the Lord, wherefore turn yourselves and live ye. So you see there that there's that element of work salvation there, which is impossible. But there's also the element of the new covenant here. Because how do we get this new heart and this new spirit? Is it through the flesh? Is it through the works? You know, doing good works? It's no. See, so there's that illusion there that how do we get this righteousness? Is it through actually turning from our sins and keeping good works? No, it is through turning from the dead works, faith toward God, believing on Jesus Christ, and we get that new heart and that new spirit. So in the Old Testament, you'll see elements, you know. God's mercy is good. He's good for his mercy endureth forever. Those elements are there, but also works, right? So that's the problem. A man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Right? So, saved by grace through faith. Right? This is one of our memory verses. You should have one of these, have this memorized. This is our belief salvation four. One of the three verses of salvation four. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Now let's talk about grace versus works. So we know that these can't be put together. Right? You can't mix grace and works. If by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. So we know, we're familiar with the analogy, it's a gift, it's free, something's free, can't pay for it. So... This idea that people have to do my part to get salvation. 
is false. You know, you don't do your part to obtain salvation. And sometimes where people get tripped up is that sometimes we think something is reasonable and therefore it might be right. See, this is why, you know, it's, it's, it's sometimes difficult to have conversations out soul winning. And, and you, can't, you can't really claim that we're the only ones that have a reasonable or logical position. Right? So you need to understand, this, this is what's sometimes difficult when I talk to people about soul winning, is people think if something is reasonable and logical, it, therefore it must be right. But no, because you need to understand how logic and reason work. Right? How do logic and reason work? You have to start off with some starting assumptions. It's like in maths. You know in maths, you have like, I don't know what they call, I don't know what they call like axioms. Well, is an axiom, so maybe it's a self-proving thing. But it's like, you have these assumptions in maths. So you like assume these things, and then you can go and do your formulas and say, well, if this is this, then this makes sense, and then, you know, if that y equals d, and therefore, blah, 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 and then they show a proof. But it always starts with starting assumptions, right? So this is why when you argue, you debate, and, you know, you say, well, I'm making sense, why don't you get it? And they say, well, you're not making sense. You need to understand because there are differing starting assumptions here. Like when I'm talking to a Muslim and they're making a lot of sense, they probably are making a lot of sense. But why are they making a lot of sense? It's because they have the starting assumption that Muhammad is the last prophet, there's one God, there's no Trinity, there's no Son of God, God can't manifest in the flesh. So for them, they're like, it makes no sense. You know, they say to you, it makes no sense that, you know, gee, God, almighty God comes, he's born of a woman, you know, uh, why doesn't it make sense to them? It's because they don't accept those presuppositions. It makes sense to us because we accept those starting assumptions. So just be careful and just think about this when you talk to people, soul winning, talk to people, that you don't just get into an argument of well, who's more reasonable. Yes, it's important that we have positions that are reasonable so we don't seem unreasonable. So you do want a position that is consistent and logical and rational, right? But when you have two rational positions, now what is, where is the differentiator? Who's got the right assumptions, right? This is why you can, you can argue over, oh, but this is why, because God needs a saviour, you know, and it makes sense because we need, we need blood, we need a saviour. They're like, oh, why can't God just like begin? And sometimes you get into an argument at the top level. And then remember, you're just arguing over who's more logical. But you may both be being logical. So you want to then bring the conversation to why do you accept those truths? Where do those truths come from? And that's it's a difficult thing to have. And that's why, because not everyone... You know, you may not even realize when you talk you have assumptions. Everyone has starting assumptions. That's the faith. That's the foundational faith that then builds your thinking. And most people that you talk to have not thought that deeply about their faith. And that's why sometimes it's difficult for them to see that they have these starting assumptions. And then to challenge those assumptions starts getting quite personal. So, again, you know, it's like it's one of those things where, you know, I wish it was that simple. To, to win people over. The concept is simple, but it gets quite deep. Now, why am I saying that? Because for somebody to say, look, you know, if I just have to do one thing to get saved, you know, that's reasonable. You know, like Jesus did it all, he died on the cross, but I just have to get baptized. You know, I just have to, what were they saying in the Galatian church? Just get circumcised. But see, that's the problem. It's not, it's not that these positions are not reasonable with those assumptions, right? If you have the wrong starting assumptions. The right starting assumption is that this is not even an option. You, know, you don't have the option of mixing the two, right? You've got grace and you've got works. You've got two separate options. There is no option when you mix the two. And that's the problem. That's what the person has to see, right? Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. You see there, that there's no mixing. If you want to do a work, you've got to do everything. It's always, it's either all works, it's grace. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever you are justified by the law. You are fallen from grace. So, this is why somebody can't believe salvation, 
salvation by grace and believe also that you can lose your salvation. You know, because if you think through this, I just, I think, and, and you know, I may be wrong, this is like the extent of my thoughts, is that there is no practical difference between somebody who believes you can lose your salvation and somebody who believes in work salvation. Because think about this, right? Like, and I, I, I've said this before, but if they believe in work salvation, then, you know, you can deal with that. But if somebody believes salvation is by grace, but they believe you can lose your salvation, doesn't that mean the moment you lose it, you can instantly get it back? Because it's by grace, right? So what is the point of losing your salvation if you can just get it back instantly, by grace? And is that not how eternal security works? That, you know, is, is it that grace is just like a little bit behind your sin? Right? And you sin and you have to get grace again and you sin and it's like, it's like sin is just in front of grace. Right? But then <laughs> that's how it would work if you could lose your salvation. But grace, you know, grace is greater than our sin. Where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. So that the reality is grace just stays ahead. So you never actually lose your salvation, even though you may commit something that is maybe worthy, well, they would deem worthy of you losing your salvation, but you stay eternally saved because the grace is there. It keeps abounding more than the sin. So either grace continues to cover sins that would make you lose your salvation, or is grace just enabling you to continue receiving, you know, like is grace just enabling you to keep salvation just long enough before you lose it? Because you know, because if you can lose salvation, do you ever really have it? Right, like think about it. If you can lose salvation, do you ever really have it? Because you can't say I'm saved if one day you might lose it. So how is that any different to somebody trying to work their way to heaven? Because you may be a step closer, but are you saved yet? Well, no. So what's the difference between somebody like supposedly taking three steps towards salvation and then two steps back and then five steps towards salvation and then like two steps back and, like they're slowly getting closer but they never actually get there because it's like work salvation to somebody who's I'm saved for two days and then I lost salvation. Now I'm saved for five days and then I've lost salvation for ten days and then I get salvation for a year and then I lose it for two years. Like, I mean, is that... To me, is that not practically the same thing? Somebody's working for salvation. Because they never actually get it, but instead of just saying that they're getting closer to salvation, we're just saying they're saved for a temporary period. It's like the terminology is just different, but in practicality, it's the exact same thing. So, I think, and I may be wrong, but unless you guys can make me think otherwise, I just think, if somebody believes you can lose your salvation, even if they think like losing your salvation by not believing, you know, not believing on Jesus Christ anymore. Because some people say, you know, losing your salvation is not through sinning, right? It's by like, you know, you just don't believe Jesus is God. And because you, know, you believe Jesus is God and you believe that he's your saviour, but one day you don't believe, right? You don't believe it anymore. But, you know, idolatry is like still a sin. So there's still some sin that has made them lose salvation, even though it's a sin of something you believe as opposed to a sin of something you did, right? So how is that any different? You are still trying to keep your salvation. Trying to keep your salvation, I think, is no different to working for your salvation. It's just the terminology is different, but ultimately you have not reached that end goal that is required, which is actual salvation, right? So do you ever really have salvation if it can be lost and it can't mix two? Now, number three, let's talk about like another... Uh, complexity. And I think it's important that you guys understand this because I feel like this one used to trip me up a lot too. And I think it still trips people up today that don't distinguish the difference between faith and grace. Okay, so Ephesians 2, 8 to 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, I like the way Ephesians 2 phrases salvation here because I think it's very specific in how it actually operates, right? 
So by grace, so grace is what saves us, and we receive that grace through faith. Now, oftentimes we get into discussions and people, you know, they will use these terms interchangeably. It's grace alone, it's faith alone. And what they're saying is not right, excuse me, it's not wrong. But we just need to understand, like, what do we mean by that? When we say salvation is by faith alone, right? And if that's like your go-to phrase, you just need to understand what you're saying. I think it's better to be in the habit of saying salvation is by grace alone, right? Because grace, I think, means something, the same thing to more people. But faith is like a very broad term. So when we say faith alone, you just need to understand that when you say faith alone, whoever's listening to you sometimes will hear it differently, right? And this is what I started to realize when I, when I say, you know, sometimes you're at a door and you say to like somebody who's like got a Christian background and you say, do you think you can lose your salvation? And then they say, yeah, but they might not be thinking it in the way we think, like you are saved and then you're not saved because I think what I realized is when they hear, can you lose your salvation? They're thinking, well, my salvation is my faith. But to them, their faith is how they live. So some people think, can you lose your salvation? It's like, can you lose your faith? Meaning, can you stop serving God? Can you get out of church? And I say, well, of course. So that's just one thing I have to be careful of when I talk to people, that sometimes that's what they hear, even though what we're saying is, no, can you be in a state of being saved and then lose that state of being saved? They're thinking, well, my faith my is me living for God. And obviously I can walk away from God. And that's what they think. But then that's why they respond with, well, I won't walk away from God. <laughs> right? Because they think that's what their salvation is, is the fact that they're in this kind of positive state where they're on their way to, to heaven. So you have grace and you have faith. Now, the reason why you know, this is important to understand the distinction between grace and faith. So grace is the unmerited favour. We receive it through faith. So when we say faith alone, we're saying that the only way to receive this grace is through faith. Right? By believing on Jesus Christ is how we get this grace. Right? We don't get it through sacraments. We don't get it through these other methods. We don't get it through works, basically. So it's not grace through works. It's grace through faith. But what you need to understand is faith is a broader term than just faith on Jesus Christ. Right? Faith is you believe something. And this is why you receive grace through faith, but remember you also do works through faith. And this is why living the Christian life is, is called the faith. Right? Because there's, there's more to the Christian life. There's more in the Christian life than just believing what salvation is. In the Christian life, you also have believing what is right and wrong. Believing what God's commandments are versus what God's commandments aren't. You know, and things like that. So that also in, is entailed in faith. And this is why you don't want to get thrown off by these sort of verses that make salvation sound like works or salvation sound like a process where that you're working towards when it's using the word faith as opposed to receiving grace and salvation, right? Because sometimes people, they, they think just it's faith alone, it's faith, faith, and they equate faith with salvation. And then they get mixed up because of the wrong assumption at the beginning when they read verses about faith. Colossians 2.6, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. So is this necessarily saying that you're established just in what the doctrine of salvation? No, it's established in the faith, right? So it's, it's more, it's, when it's saying established in the faith, it's the Christian life. The beginning is salvation, but there's much more to it, right? 2 Corinthians 5, Therefore we are always confident that knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, and not by sight. See, so if your assumption is just faith is salvation, it's like we're walking by salvation? No, it's because we walk by faith 
we obey. See, how does that work? Remember, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So, so why is it also faith when you're obeying God? Because you read the Bible, you believe the Bible, and you do it because you believe it. That's the faith there. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That's uh, one of our memory verses in uh, grace. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So this is, I believe, teaching that you go from salvation to then good works, which are also done by faith. But it's faith. So you don't want to be put off there. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. But before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. See, so is this saying that without salvation it's impossible to please him? Well, that, that statement, that's true. You, know, you need to be saved in order to please God. Not only please God without salvation. But... It's also believing God's word, doing things by faith, living by faith, that pleases him. You know? So even you know, a, a believer can do things not by faith, right? Not believing God's word. So, you know, faith is more than just salvation. He that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, and whatsoever is not of faith is sin. You see, so faith <coughs> is a bigger term than just than grace you know so faith entails so you don't want to be thrown off by scriptures that talk about continuing in the faith being established in the faith our faith because yeah that there is an element of faith that is the way we live our faith how we live as a christian right now let me talk about something else for a bit you know how when it comes to salvation, and I'm um, just talking about this because Ash and I were talking about this in depth, and I just want to share my thoughts on it again when you think about it. One, one, there's, there's different parts to the salvation. Mm, I might say it that way. There's different areas to address. And sometimes when you're arguing with somebody about salvation, sometimes you're addressing different topics and you don't realize that you're like crossing over. So, think about this. One part of the discussion on salvation is how to get saved. Right? So, that's what we talk about. Salvation by grace, it's not of works. That's how you actually obtain salvation. Then another part to discuss is, can salvation be lost? So, once you, so this is once you obtain salvation... Can salvation be lost for any reason? Now, although these are intertwined, like we talked about, if somebody believes they can lose their salvation, in a sense, they are practically believing work salvation. But they're two different topics, right? Because one is talking about how to get to a certain point, and then another is saying, once you get to that certain point, can you lose it? Right? So sometimes when you're talking to somebody about salvation and work salvation, you know, you don't, you, you don't want to know, like, what, what part are we talking about? And then there's another part, which is, what is the response of somebody once they are saved? What's the expected behavior? Is it automatic? Is that evidence of whether they're saved or not? So sometimes, and this is where a lot of the confusion lies, a lot of the miscommunication, sometimes when we talk about what we expect to happen with a believer after salvation gets tied into what happens for salvation. And they're actually two different things. You know, I used to think that they are the same. Like if somebody believes, you know, somebody gets saved, and they're going to do works, and then therefore it proves whether they're saved or not. Is that somebody believing in work salvation? After thinking about it and talking it in depth with Ashton, I think that they are distinctly different. Right, So if somebody believes once a person is saved by grace, there's an expected change. Right? Is that person believing in work salvation? I don't think so. But what I would say is that their assurance of salvation would be very confusing. And eventually they start saying things that work salvation is saying. 
right? Which is, well, you know, you've got to have faith and works and things like that. And it's like, but, but they'll admit that it's not required beforehand because they admit that it's something that happens afterwards. So really, it's a topic of what is the expected change afterwards? So a couple of thoughts here is, <coughs> you know how people will say, sometimes they'll say the statement, if you really believe something, and this one used to throw me off, so I don't know if it's thrown you off before. They'll say something like, well, if you really believe something, you would change. Otherwise, you don't really believe it. Now, is that a true statement? I think it is. It's a true statement. That if you believed something, and, and there was no like, change to align with that belief, then the question is, do you really believe it? Now, but here's, here's the answer. And this is why it always like threw me off, right? Because what are you believing to get saved? You know, so they'll say like, oh, if you believe something, but then you, you subtly accept their assumption, which is, I have to believe, I have to follow Jesus. But is that what you have to believe to be saved? You don't have to believe to be saved, that you have to like submit to God's will, make Jesus the Lord of your life, turn from all your sins, so if, you, if that doesn't change after salvation, are you acting contrary to your beliefs? No, because you didn't have to believe that to be saved. Right? So I don't believe I have to do works for salvation. Hence, I can believe on Christ without doing works. Right? So, so what do you have to believe to be saved? You have to believe that Christ is your saviour. Right? And you need to have a change in belief from what dead works, you repent from dead works, and have faith toward God. Now, can somebody believe that without believing that? I mean, I know it's kind of redundant me saying that, but obviously if somebody believes that to be saved, they need to believe that to be saved. So when people say, how can you believe that and not change? Well, the change did occur. Because what changed? They changed from trusting dead works or trusting a false religion, and now they're trusting Jesus Christ. It's just that that's not a change in works. It's a change in their faith. Right? But there was a change. Right? And it was consistent with what they believed because what they believed was not that they had to change their works to be saved. What they believed is they had to accept Christ as Saviour. Now some people might say, well, you have to believe that your sins are wrong and that you're deserving of hell. Well, yes, they have to believe that. Do they believe that? Yes. Do they have to believe, therefore, if they believe that, that there has to be a change in their actions? They don't, do they? You don't have to believe that sin is wrong and I'm sorry for them and I'm willing to change my life and I'm willing to stop doing them. That's not what they have to believe. They just have to believe that it's wrong and that they deserve hell because of it. But do they have to believe they have to change their actions? No. So you see how it's not actually inconsistent because you can believe these things. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to have a change in works. So the change in belief is the change. Now, so people say like, yeah, but how can somebody get saved and there be no change? So remember, one point is works has nothing to do with salvation. So if works has nothing to do with salvation, why would after salvation a change in works be even relevant to the point of whether or not they're saved? It had nothing to do with it. So the other point that we were talking about is we, also, we not only accept that works has nothing to do with salvation, the other thing we accept is the decision to, to change is not automatic, right? which is why I'm here, Galatians 5, 16. This I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So if somebody says, well, when you get saved, there's got to be some change. My question is, well, is change automatic? And if it's automatic, why isn't it, why don't we just get completely changed? Like if it's not, if it's not our choice and, and, and the extent of our effort and our decision is what changes us, and it's just God, you know, because it's like, who can, you know, risk the Holy, Holy Ghost in you, aren't you a new creature and you're living, well, why, why don't we just get all the way cha changed? You know, that's like people say, he didn't just get saved, he got all the way saved, right? <laughs> but does anyone actually get all the way saved? I mean, it was automatic, why don't we just get all the way saved? Because it's not automatic, 
Right? And it's, that's the reality of it. So because it's not automatic, that means there's a choice on our part. So we only see changes in a person's life if they choose to walk in the Spirit. So why are there so many people saved and maybe you don't see any change? Well, it's because they didn't make the choice to change. You're not seeing that new man. And one thing we were talking about, Ashton and I, was why don't we see more people? Like, how can there be so many people saved and more people don't live for God? We don't see a visible change. Well, so what we were talking about was, well, then what's the percentage? You know, if we're saying that there's a likelihood of people changing after getting saved and they have a visible change in their works, what do we think the percentage of people are that get saved actually do something to live for God? Is that a high percentage? Is it a low percentage? Is it 75% of it? You know, you get three people saved, four, you know, you get four people saved. Should three people have a visible change? Should one person have a visible change? Remember, one person out of four, that's still 25%. Right? What do we think the percentage is? Well, I think the percentage is very minuscule. So my argument is maybe we just haven't seen enough people saved to see what that percentage is. Because what if that percentage is 1%? Yeah, you have to get 100 people saved before one person makes a visible change. Right? And then how many people of that 1 in 100 have a change where it's like consistent? You know? And how many people of the change that's consistent actually goes on to do great things for God? And that percentage is minute. So it doesn't surprise me that, that a lot of people can be saved. I don't have a problem with a lot of people getting saved and maybe we don't see a lot of changes. Right? We know that it's minimal. Then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is, truly is plenty, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. So, unfortunately, most believers don't make the choice to walk in the Spirit. And the ones that do, even less, do it faithfully. You know? So, another point is, and I probably won't spend too much time on this point, but but, you know, people ask the question, what if I stop believing? Because you know, we talk about faith and grace. So remember, we're saved by grace through faith. So some people, they get mixed up because when they say we're saved by faith, and then they say, well, what happens if I stop believing? I lose my faith. Am I still saved? Because that's what, that's what saved me. But remember, is that what saved you? No. What saved you, I mean, I won't say no, but you just have to understand. What saved you is the grace that you received through faith. So that's why I, I try to explain to people that it's not the state of your faith that is keeping you saved. It's not that, okay, I'm believing on Jesus, I'm trusting him, and I have to keep trusting him, and it's like I keep myself saved. That's not how it works, right? Because it's not your faith that keeps you saved. What keeps you saved? The grace of God. So you receive the grace of God through an act of faith. What is that act of faith? Jesus, save me. That's the act of faith, that you believe that somebody's answering that prayer and then you call on him in faith, you receive the grace. Now the grace is keeping you saved. And this is why your faith can go up and down. Even your faith about salvation, you know, you've got your faith in your Christian life, like the works we talked about, can fluctuate, go up and down and doubts and things, but that doesn't change that the grace has been received at that point when you exercised faith by calling upon the name of the Lord. And this is why. The Bible can say these things. And it's a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. So don't get mixed up with this verse. The reason why I included this verse is sometimes if you're trying to show somebody this verse, and they see this verse, they're like, wait a second. If you deny him, you're going to deny salvation, right? Which is not. Like, this is being denied rewards, right? So just make sure you understand this passage. We suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. This is the rewards. If we deny him, this is the opposite now, we deny him, he will deny us. Right? Because we are requesting rewards. Right? If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Because salvation is a promise from God. This is why salvation is eternal. Because if he promises it, he can't deny his own promise. Right? So just don't get. Don't get, uh, don't get uh, um, mixed up on those verses. Okay? Now, <clears throat> I might just skip over this point because the sermon's getting a bit longer. But the point here was 
Do, does a person need to call upon the Lord to be saved? Yes. You know, and that, the reason why this point is important and how it ties into the sermon is because calling upon the Lord is not works. You know, a lot of people think calling upon the Lord is work salvation. That's not. You know, um, but I won't go through that, through this sermon for just for sake of time, right? That, and you ask for salvation. It's not work salvation. But I do believe you need to ask for salvation. You know, you need to call upon the Lord. Some people believe that just accepting, acknowledging the fact that Jesus Christ is the Savior is what saves you. But I, I don't think it does. Like I think you acknowledge him as your Savior and the way you then believe on Christ, you express it by calling upon him. That's the point of salvation. When you, you, in faith, you call upon him believing that he's your Savior. Right? So I would liken it to, you know, just saying to somebody, like if, I, if, I, if, if, if Alex was going to give me something, and I know that Alex was, is going to give me something if I ask him, and I say to Caleb, Caleb, yes, I acknowledge that Alex will give me that thing if I ask it from him. Do I have it? I don't, right? I then have to go to Alex, believing that thing, and go, Alex, I would like that thing that you're offering. So that's how I see salvation, is that, and you know, it, it may be a mute point, because I think everyone who knows Alex has given out something for free, and it's valuable, and they believe it, will probably go and get it from Alex, right? So, but I'm saying it is, there is a distinction. And the people that teach that just acknowledging it is enough, I don't think so. I think the believing on Christ is expressed through calling upon him. That's how we go to him in faith. Because if you've just acknowledged it in your head, how have you gone to Jesus for salvation? You know, that's why there's a, there's a calling. But the reason why it's important is because it is not work salvation. You know, if you ask somebody for something, that's still a gift. And the last thing I just wanted to talk about is... If we believe salvation by grace, does that mean we believe that we give people a license to sin? Because people say, well, if you, if you live however you want and you still go to heaven, that, aren't you saying that therefore it's okay to live however you want? And this is one thing I think you need to understand very well because it comes up heaps when you're talking to people. They always confuse us teaching salvation by grace with us condoning a lifestyle of sin. And why is that? It's because people have believed in work salvation for so long. They've been taught salvation for so long. They, they just naturally, their presupposition is that they go to heaven because they deserve it. They go to heaven because they've done good, because they've lived a good enough life. They've lived a life worthy of heaven. So when you say, well, you don't live a life worthy of heaven, and yet you, you go to heaven anyway, they automatically think that you're condoning that lifestyle because it's like, how did that life earn them a place in heaven? And that's usually why there's this confusion. So you just need to understand that, no, just because we believe grace covers sin, that doesn't mean we are condoning sin. You know, if we would use the analogy of a parent and a child. If you tell your child they will always be your child, even if they are naughty, are you saying that it's okay for them to be naughty? You're not, right? So Romans 5 and Romans 6, these are verses that really cover these points, right? Romans 5.20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So there's that salvation. There's that no matter what happens, you're always saved. But Romans 6 tells us, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So, we don't, what we don't do is we don't preach a work salvation to get people to change their actions. And this is why it's so important, because people think, well, if you change the message, people will have a change in behavior. Yeah, I'm sure my children might change their behavior too if I tell them if you don't live right, you know, you don't obey me, you're not going to be my children anymore. Right? That might be a motivator. But is it the right motivator? Is it even true? No. So, what are some reasons to do right if going to heaven is not one of those reasons? Well, here's six, right? One is 
that you love God. You know, you want to do what's right for God, you're, you're grateful. Number two is because you have a love for others. Because you don't want your actions to impact others. And sometimes grievous sins impacts other people's lives. I mean, think about murder, think about adultery. These are huge sins that affect people's lives. I mean, even committing suicide can affect people's lives and have an on-flow effect. You know? A love for yourself, just doing what's right by yourself. You know, taking care of yourself, you know, not smoking, not drinking, keeping your body clean. You know, these, these things, you know, affect you as well as a person. It affect your, your, your quality of life. Number four, chastisement from God. So it's not eternal punishment, but we still should fear chastisement from a loving Heavenly Father, just like we fear our parents telling us off. Number five, earthly consequences. So maybe you don't want to do wrong because, you know, you may get a fine. You might get criminal charges. You might, you know, have problems with the law. And number six, and I kind of put these in this order for because I think this should be the priority of your motivations. But the last one is, you know, eternal rewards. That you are investing your time in something that has eternal value. So there are plenty of reasons to do good works even though salvation is free and no matter how we live, if we put our faith on Jesus Christ, we'll be saved. Okay, so I hope you learned something today. I know it's getting a bit deep. It might sound like I'm going unnecessarily deep, but you know, if you really understand this information, it will help you when you are reasoning with people about salvation, you know, common objections and things that people say. And sometimes you don't realize where you're getting tripped up because you, you haven't fully understood these starting assumptions. And when you do, it makes having that conversation a lot easier. And like I said, it's no different with fighting. Once you understand, you know, different moves and stuff, it, it becomes a lot less intimidating and a lot less complex to you. And it allows you then to pinpoint what do I need to actually explain and where is this person missing it if you understand it really well. So not only that, make you a better witness, but it also give you like rock solid stability in your own Christian life. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for salvation. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord, that you will help us all to, you know, learn this knowledge. You know, I pray that you know, everyone would be able to explain the things and understand the things to the level that I have, but even more so, Lord. I want them to excel and, and, and be experts at salvation. Help us to be the best witnesses that we can be. And um, I pray, Lord, that will also help us to teach the next generation. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.